Now, chapter 18 is where the discourse is, where Jesus talks about life in this new uh, uh, fellowship, life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, life as a man or woman of the new covenant. But before we reach there, which is chapter 18, as in the previous discourses, the evangelist builds up to that point by using vignettes of stories that in the other gospels, like Mark, may be dispersed all over the gospel. In the case of Matthew, he puts them together to start staging for the main theme, which is a discourse to the church. For example, if we go to, uh, we, we said chapter um we read the uh, uh, discourse on the commission. Now, the, chapter 18 is a discourse on uh, the new community, the, the church, the ecclesia. But if you go back all the way to chapter 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, now chapter 13 was the third discourse. So 14, 15, 16, 17, these are all preparation for the discourse, which is in 18, which is about the new life in the new uh, covenant, the church, the ecclesia. How, how do these materials serve as a staging or as preparation? Well, Jesus starts preaching now uh, with two tones. On the one hand, he starts praising, blessing, and performing miracles on his followers. On the other hand, for the first time, beginning with chapter 14, he starts chastising those who are... Um, arrogantly refusing to listen. Remember last time we spoke, they have ears, but they don't listen. Isaiah, well, now he says, that's it. He starts performing miracles versus uh, um, chastising those who chose not to follow him. For example, you go to chapter 14. The first verse is a miracle about healing the sick. And then the following verse is about feeding the hungry. Then we go to a story where Jesus confronts the Pharisees. If you go, for example, to, let's say, let me find it for you here. Yeah, 15.1, for example. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the um, tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Usually up until now, Jesus will answer them uh, and then kind of ignore them, walk away. In this case, Jesus starts rebuking them. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah. For God said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil, father and mother. But you say that whoever tells father and mother, whatever support you might have had from me is given to you, then that person need not honor the father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. You Hypocrites. <laughs> Hypocrites. Yes, Portsem Karazis with Kordazilas, Mother. Pites Medere Kordazaza. You hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips. I made what it needs to be in Tiarugo. In vain do they worship me teaching human precepts as doctrine. It's very strong. It's a, a drastic uh, modification of his strategy to deal with the opponents. Up until now, they ask, he answers them. In a few times, he in a way challenged them. This is, what do you say? Why do you say that? But in this case, he's had it. He actually starts rebuking them. And this is a new kind of um, tendency we start find in Jesus' uh, dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those kind of rejecting his gospel. But this is not only here. This pattern of uh, blessing those who follow Jesus or follow him 
and rebuking those who are against them continues in the remainder of this part of, of the gospel. For example, later on, again, we read the, if you continue chapter 15, you'll see he again heals the sick and again feeds the hungry. The story of the feeding of the hungry is mentioned twice in Matthew. And then the third element is uh, confronting the Pharisees. So do you see, there's a pattern, literary pattern that is creating. Miracle, miracle to the people of God, to the ecclesia, to those who decide to follow Jesus, and then rebuking, in fact, cursing those who chose to knowingly ignore God's invitation of salvation. Repeats again, miracle, healing the sick, miracle, uh, feeding the hungry, and then rebuking. This pattern repeating twice, we reach kind of the, the focus of this unit. This is all preparation, remember, for the, for, the, for the discourse. We read Jesus prophesying about his death. Jesus, for the first time, says to his apostles, the time will come when the Son of Man will be handed over to the uh, pagans, and he'll be tortured, and he'll be crucified. As he uh, identifies himself with the sufferings of the Son of Man, which is associated with the Messiah, expected Messiah to come, the next stage uh, we read about is the transfiguration, which actually shows Jesus' divinity. Uh, it's a powerful element because now he's telling his three disciples, I am God. So this, again, starts gradually becoming more and more public. Up until now, if he did whatever he performed a miracle, he said, Keep this secret. Do not tell anybody. Go and you know give your korban to the priest. Uh, but gradually we're seeing not only public opposition and rebuke of the enemies, but also public announcement of who he is. This is intentionally being increased. It's a powerful strategy. So it aggravates his enemies to the extent when the time comes, they will crucify him because he came to die as a ransom of our sins. Thus, the uh, transfiguration, which is here in chapter 17, plays an important role as a, uh, one of these stages of Jesus going public, although he it wasn't public, it was on top of Mount, and it was only three disciples, apostles with him. Uh, he comes down from this experience of the uh, transfiguration. Again, forgive me, I have to rush through these things uh, because we don't have much time. And then we go back to the second foretelling of his crucifixion. For the second time, he says, for the Son of Man uh, will be crucified. Uh, if you don't know what I am, chapter 17, verse 13. I'm kind of skimming through these things so we can finish. So 17, verse 13, if you read it, you see, so also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. They did not get it. But he prophesied that the Son of Man will be handed over and will suffer at the hands of the enemies. The following part uh, after this comes again this blessing, miracle, and rebuke. Jesus rebukes his enemies. Well, first he performs a miracle of the epileptic. And then he goes and he rebuked, verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon and came out of him. And the disciples were, and then furthermore, uh, uh, because of your little faith, uh, he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from there to there, and it will move, and nothing will be possible for you. Uh, blessing, miracle, and then chastising those who do not want to believe or have, have uh, little faith. Since we read this verse, let me quickly say, obviously Jesus is not saying, not saying. as you increase your faith, you start doing other things to the extent that we can move physically mountains. Jesus or God does not want billions of his creatures start 
changing the demography and the geography of the world. So you sleep, you're uh, in New York, you wake up in a nice island in Athens or Greece, because a Havadatsya person decided to move a mountain from New York to, to the Mediterranean. Obvious, it's a Semitic explanation. You can do the impossible with Christ. Moving a mountain, I mean, moving a tree is a major ha uh, hassle. Moving a mountain is an impossibility. It's an idiomatic expression. Please don't um, just, uh, blame yourself. Oh, I'm of little faith. I can't move a mountain. And you wake up in the morning and say, uh, uh, you know, Mount Everest, move, and doesn't move. Oh, oh. Obviously, it's symbolic. Please don't take it uh, as you can physically move mountains. If God wants... In his mercy, in his uh, all-knowing wisdom, he may move mountains, but usually he doesn't change our habitat so far. You know, it's the same mountains, rivers that we know. We grow, if things may happen gradually, so we don't feel it, but, you know, don't feel like physically you will move mountains, but know that if you have a strong faith, you can do the impossible, make it possible. Again, he comes here and the Pharisees target him. Does your teacher not pay taxes? Um, and Jesus answers Simon and says, well, where these powers come from? It comes from people. Well, chapter 18 is where we begin the actual discourse. That's when Jesus starts a long sermon about what it means to be Christian and how we have to live our Christian life versus those hypocrite sons of viper, vipers, the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the non-believers. The first thing in chapter 18 is humility and forgiveness. As Christians, as members of this new fellowship of the new covenant with Christ, we are called to be humble and to be forgiving. Chapter 18 starts with that. Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and he said, Amen, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name, my name welcomes me. If anyone puts stumbling block before one of these children who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drawn, drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. A verse that I love and the verse that challenges me a lot because uh, sometimes with our actions or inactions, we become stumbling blocks in the journey of the faith of other people. And we have to be very careful. Words we say, uh, comments we make, priorities we set up for our children. Um, I think that's for our children. They have to play all the games, sports. They have to play all the instruments. <laughs> They have to speak uh, 22 languages, including Japanese and Chinese. So when they go to college, they may get scholarship. But it is all these, they have to, they have to, there's no, they have to go to church on Sunday. It's not one of these important things. So I worry, uh, am I becoming, with my actions and deeds and words and priorities, a stumbling block for others to come closer to Jesus? But not only humility and forgiveness, he also starts warning uh, the new community of uh, the consequences of not being humble and forgiving uh, as Christians should be. And he talks about the punishment of hell, verses 7 to 9. Yes, yeah, stumbling block. So those who uh, do these things become obstacle. It's better for them to put a millstone on their uh, necks and actually commit suicide. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off 
and throw it away. Please don't take it verbally seriously like Augustine did. Augustine did, and end up with a major problem. Obviously, our Lord yeah, does not want us to inflict pain, pain on our eyes and to defile the body that he created for us. When he, he says, plug or cut off um, that eye or that foot that is causing you to stumble, he means totally stay away from whatever that act of temptation is. If it's your, if it's eyes, your eyes that's making you uh, tempted because you're watching things, Stop watching, watching or reading things or whatever, seeing things. Stop it. As opposed to reading, seeing, and then try, I'm trying not to sin, but I can't. If it's your hands that you're doing things that's leading you to sin, stop doing that. End that function of your arm. End that function of your eye. But definitely not plug your eye. I'm not sure how long will you live if you plug your eye and cut your arm. It's a matter of a few minutes, maybe. And the church would have lost a member of the church. Obviously, it's not physically cut your arm or plug your eye. Uh, the little ones, it's very important. Children in, in the Bible are symbols of the powerless. Because... Um, Men had their jobs, had the wealth. Women were married to their husbands, so their husband, you know. But children were the most vulnerable, powerless element in the society. So Jesus is asking us to protect those who are the most vulnerable, the most powerless in our society. That's why he says earlier and now also, where he says, um, be like these children, he then says, remember verse uh, be humble. Yes, verse four. Whoever becomes humble like this child is greatest. So in other words, don't go and do things to be smaller or to look younger or to when he says be like these children, he's saying be humble. The act of humility. Children are always, when they talk, they look down. They don't look up to you. Um, they're afraid, uh, you know. Uh, that's part of the element of, uh, you know, the requirement or uh, expectations of the new community of covenant. To be humble, not to be assuming, uh, to help those who are uh, needy and uh, powerless. Verses 10 to 15 this is one discourse, okay? He talks about the church being um, the followers of God and then the concept of one lost sheep. Uh, and, the, and the force of this argument in this part of the development of the theology of Matthew is that we are all important to God. Even if one Vochkar uh, is lost, uh, you know, we'll leave the 99, we'll go to look for that one. We are all important for God. It is important also to be disciplined when the members of this new covenant start erring. It is our duty to correct them. So, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you to that very uh, to that every word so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses if the member refuses to listen to them tell it to the church and the offender refuses to listen even to the church let such a one be to you as a gentile and tax collector ironically matthew was a tax collector so it's very important. It's not a kind of three, each one was this and this, and, you know, happy ever after. If you err, somebody must correct you. The church is not a place to be politically correct. The two clash in the church. You shouldn't be politically correct. If your friend is doing something wrong against the gospel, you're supposed to tell her or tell him. 
And if you realize he or she is not listening, then you increase the pressure by bringing two, three other of your friends, assuming these friends are Christians, not just gossiping and they hate the other friend they come. Assume they're Christians. And if that doesn't work, then you engage the pastor, the whole church. The pastor is the representative of the whole community. If that doesn't work, then she's saying, as far as I'm concerned, that person is not a man of the new covenant. If he's not forgiving, if he's not willing to sit with you and re get reconciled, that he is not a man of the new covenant. The verses, the following verses again, uh, uh, the evangelist focuses on forgiveness. For example, verse 1, uh, 21. Then Peter came to said to the gym, Lord, if another member of the church uh, sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times, said to him Jesus. Not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Even if he hadn't said 77 times, seven in the Jewish traditions is number of fulfillment. I, I told you this the first session we met. I hope you remember. I said the word in Hebrew, shba, is the same roots that comes for seven. The two words come from the same root. Now, of course, the Masoretic text changed the vowel uh, signs and the way they are pronounced are different, but they are from the same thing, seven and filled, being filled. So that's why in the Bible, the number seven is always number of fulfillment, of perfection. The world was created in seven days. Okay, uh, The week has seven days. Uh, you know, seven is uh, the day of judgment, of book of Revelation, with seven trumpets. Uh, seven angels will come. Uh, so seven is the number of fulfillment. Had he even not said this second part, the first part was enough for me to understand that he's not saying just so I count one, two, three. You know, this is your seventh time. Otherwise, I'm not going to forgive you. Obviously not. Seven in the same of Shabbat is seven times, as many times he sins. As a member of the new covenant, you're supposed to forgive him. Okay, uh, I'm careful of the time. This uh, ends chapter 18, which was the discourse about the new covenant or about the church. It's referred to as uh, talking to the church or uh, the community discourse or the discourse to the church. Now, the final discourse, which is discourse number five, is the eschatological discourse. This discourse about the end of times. And this discourse is 23, 24, and 25. But before we move there, let me just remind you, this is important. So chapter 18 was uh, the fourth discourse. Eighteen one says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the child to him, he put among them and said, and he starts talking, continues talking. If you go to chapter 19, when Jesus has finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea. That's how scholars see this as one unit, as a discourse. Uh, and of course, the theme, as I tried very quickly to demonstrate to you, uh, is the theme of separating the men of men on of new covenant versus Pharisees, Sadducees, which climax in chapter 18, where he actually talks to the people of the church. Be forgiving, you know, be loving, be humble, uh, and all, all these things. And, and if a brother sins against you, be mature enough to correct him privately. And then if that doesn't work, uh, bring a friend or two. Which by the way, sometimes it um, amazes me. There are people in our communities you say one word, sometimes like in a meeting, and that's it's the end of their relationship. You don't even know. They don't even tell you why. Next thing you see, hello, and they walk. And you realize something is wrong. And you need to go say, excuse me, Nero too, Baron, why are you upset at me? But the ego and, and the, uh, you know, I dare say the arrogance of this person that 
you said something in the meeting, sometimes in the sermons I say things, and I don't mean any of the individuals. Ooh, and then they take it on themselves and say, and that's the end, and that, that's it. They don't uh, disconnect. So totally categorically against what our Lord is teaching us. If your brother errs and sins seven times against you, forgive him seven times. Not only seven times, but 70 times 70. In this case, in this eschatological chapter, the Lord talks to the church about the end of the world. And this end of the world has several kind of uh, parts in it, which reminds us of the Old Testament, again, because it's Matthew writing for the Jewish people. The main theme of this discourse, which is eschatological, the word is Greek, eschaton means the end. Eschatological means uh, matters of the end of time. Uh, in, a, in a way, uh, the book of Revelation is eschatology. It's about the end of times, book of Revelation. But in this case, um, for the evangelist Matthew, Jesus takes upon himself the role of Jeremiah before the destruction of Jerusalem. So Jesus acts like Jeremiah, like Jeremiah acted against or rebuking the people of God in the Old Testament because they did not listen and warns them about what is coming as a result of their rejection of the word of God. The whole chapter, chapter 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 23, starts with a woe. If you go to chapter 23, <laughs> then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice uh, what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad, that the Jeremiah, Jeremiah thinks they were, um, and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogue and to, greet, to be greeted with respect in the marketplace, and to have people call them rabbi, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are the students. And tell no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven, nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All you exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes. And this begins a chain of seven woes. If by now we have been sensitized to the function of the digit seven, then we know that this is like the perfect, the the you know, the fulfilled, the, uh, you know, woe to the people of God who are, you know, remaining astray from the word of God, who have ears, but they don't listen. There are seven woes, one after the other. But before going to these woes, let's read this context that lead, led us to, this, to do these woes. Moses and the scribes were supposed to teach what the law, uh, I'm sorry, the scribes and the Pharisees were supposed to teach what Moses gave them, which is the Ten Commandments. Instead, the Pharisees and the scribes took Moses' revelation, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and translated that into a set of rules and regulations. And they demanded the people to adhere to these rules and regulations. An example. 
It says Sabbath, keep it holy because it's the day of the Lord. So usually for us on the on our Sabbath, which is Sunday, we don't work. Uh, I hope we read scriptures, we go to church. We are um, blessed to be in the presence of Christ through the Holy Communion and all that. But to, to make a law which says on Sunday you can't turn your light on, the switch, to switch your light on, this is not Moses. This is the scribes and the Pharisees interpreting Moses into a legal system of, I don't know, 800, 600 rules that they had. So Jesus here is warning the people that be careful because they, he says, uh, interesting phrase, the scribes then sit on Moses, uh, a Semitic verse, which means they use Moses to achieve their objective. They sit on Moses' seat. So really they're not uh, as uh, inspired, as holy as Moses was when he sat on the seat, but they sit on that seat. They use and utilize that uh, seat to utter rules and regulations that are handmade. Yes, they try to base it on the revelation of the Old Testament, but it's their decisions. It's their uh, laws. And then he adds, he says, again, criticizing the Jewish authorities of the temple, he says, they make it such a complicated thing that neither they do it, nor they allow others to do it. It makes me think sometimes of some of the uh, uh, man-made traditions associated with the church. Sometimes something very simple, whenever two or three are gathered to pray, I am there, says the Lord, we complicated and we made a big deal out of it. And, and at the end of the liturgy, nobody feels that she or he was in the presence of the Lord. So sometimes man-made regulations complicate the matter as opposed to explain the matter and makes it easier for us. It complicates the matter and becomes obstacles. There's an interesting verse, which a uh, long time ago, maybe 30 years ago, I wrote a paper on it. It says, call no one father because your father is in heaven. What does he mean by this? Um, that's why I read that paragraph to you to the end. I hope you were with me. But uh, verse 8, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have no instructor, one instructor, that is the Messiah. It's a, a very complicated uh, statement of the Lord. What he is saying, basically, in the case of the rabbinic tradition, the student was the slave, the servant of the rabbi who did everything for him, washed, cleaned, whatever, to learn from uh, the rabbi the faith. In that case, he became his father. He became his instructor. Uh, what else is he used here? Uh, he became his rabbi. But Jesus is saying, that whole function of the rabbi creating the man-made laws and regulations which complicate the faith is all now obsolete. It doesn't serve any purpose. It has to go. Not the Old Testament, not the Ten Commandments. These will continue. But the man-made traditions that came after that, which complicate the faith and turns it into a system of a legal system, that is obsolete. And because of that, the traditions associated with that, where your teacher, because he's teaching you the law, was your father, was your God, was your uh, instructor, these terms should not be used because this whole thing is gone. As Jeremiah say, says, Jeremiah says in chapter 31 of his prophecy, there'll be no need to teach the law because it'll be a gospel or a new covenant of love. God dies on the cross for you, 
inviting you to follow him to be saved. So it's not that we can't call our biological father's father. Some Protestants, that's why they don't use father. They say pastor, they say minister, but no father, because which has nothing to do with this, unfortunately. If you're calling a man father because you feel that, you know, he made you what you are, he created you, then you're wrong. But father in the sense, father in the faith, you, you know, teach, you uh, strengthen the faith of this person. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, you call your biological father, father. He says, call no one father on this earth. So what do I call, call my dad? Uh, my biological producer? I don't know. Of course, you use father. Again, you have to be careful not to take these um, verbally and verbatim and understand the context. In the Old Testament, as I said, the disciples were like the slaves. Remember, Peter said, I should wash your feet, not you wash my feet. So there was a whole element of uh, belonging to being under the uh, jurisdiction, the supervision uh, of the rabbi, where these titles came. Uh, rabbi, rabbi, which means, uh, in a way, my lord. So he says, don't use these terms for the rabbis, because they don't teach anything. In fact, they're wrong. The whole system they're teaching is wrong. I came to replace that system with the New, with the New Testament. Ay, 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 ay. We're running out of time. Uh, what else? Okay, so the woes, let's read the woes very quickly. Woe to you, scribes. He's attacking the scribes. And Pharisees. Hypocrites. This this book is read on Palm Sunday. Uh, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. For you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven, for you do not go in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell yourselves. Not only is using the world the word hypocrites, calling them, but he's saying your process of that you're using, go all over the world looking for a convert to make him a convert, that makes him a son of hell. Which means what you're teaching is wrong. It's not God's will. Which means you don't deserve for me to call you father or rabbi or instructor because you're teaching the wrong thing verse 16 woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the sanctuary is bounded by nothing but whoever swears by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by the oath here we're divorced from these things because the sanctuary is is the house of god of course but because the most precious parts were the golden elements. So, so the rabbis or the priests came up with this tradition of it's a worse sin, you know, uh, to, uh, to swear by the gold of the temple. The temple itself, you know, it's fine. But the gold, gold because it's more expensive, you know, it's more uh, bounding, binding. You blind fools, can you imagine? I mean, the vocabulary of Jesus is changing, Kishma. Will you listen to a sermon if your dead heart says fools? I'm not sure. But then, of course, we are not Pharisees and we are not uh, uh, scribes. We do exactly what our Lord asks us to do. We are forgiving and we are loving, not arrogant, very humble, welcoming those who are uh, powerless and weak. So the word is not for us. But he tells them, you blind fools, for which is the greater, the gold of the sanctuary that has made the, the gold, oh, oh, the gold of the sanctuary that has made the gold sacred, 
or I'm talking, uh, the gold or the sanctuary that has made the gold sacred. So you worry about the gold, but the gold can be anywhere else. The fact that the sanctity of this locale is that it is the temple of God and that God is supposedly present there. That's what makes this temple, you know, something can swear by. Not the golden elements, because that can be in any place. And you say, whoever swears by the altar is bound by nothing. But whoever swears by the gifts that is on the altar is bound by the altar. Obviously, people came their gifts and put at the altar, and these were very valuable things. But the altar itself was stable, so who cares about it? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the sanctuary swears by it and by everything that in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by the one who is seated on it. So don't swear by heaven because it includes God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. By now you should know Jesus had problems with the scribes, in case you didn't know. Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a grand, but swallow a camel. How true, Che? So you do a lot of minor things, you make a big deal out of it, but the key issue, just as Hosea says, I came to demand uh, love and mercy and not sacrifice. Ah, you continue doing the sacrifice and getting money for that and don't even preach a word about justice that should, should be uh, demanded by you as people of covenant with God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. So you also, on the outside, look righteous uh, to the others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy. You know why they, by the way, why they washed the graves? They did that. Because on fest festive days, when people came to visit their dead, they were not supposed to have contact with the graves. Because that grave contains a dead body, and touching a dead person was, uh, what's the word, najasa, uh, defilement, was defilement. So instead of, uh, in order to help people to come and say their prayers without being, you know, they clean the tomb. So the tomb is clean. Uh, but the thing is, he says, the tomb is clean from outside, but the inside, it remains, uh, it remains uh, dead bodies, bones. Uh, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you built the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we have lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you testify against yourselves that you are des descendant of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up them the measure of your ancestors, you snakes, Oof. you snakes, you brood of vipers, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not say it. you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? 
one way to get to hell, you're going to hell. You have no other choice. That's it. And imagine this, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees sitting in front of him. So, because it says the Pharisees came to him. Therefore, I send you prophets. Therefore, I send you prophets, saints and scribes, some of whom you kill, you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town, so that upon you may come all the righteous, all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barashiach, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Amen, I tell you, all this will come upon the generation. One of the things Jeremiah, okay, well, Jeremiah warned his people, said, woe to you, because in fact, he used the word woe, Jeremiah. Another thing Jeremiah did is he warned Jerusalem. He said, the enemies will destroy you. And Jesus does the same thing. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gather her brood under her wings and you were not killing. See, your house is left to you desolate. But I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus came out to the temple, he was going away. His disciples came to him and pointed to a building of the temple. They misunderstood. They said, Lord, this huge temple, you know, you know, how could it be destroyed? Of course, it's talking about the fact that the function of the temple is changing. God will no longer be liturgically imprisoned in the temple, but rather he'll be in the heart of every individual man or woman of the new covenant. Um, okay, I'm getting a bit of time to mention our word. Let me just jump to so this will end the final uh, discourse. Chapter 24, and I have no time to read it. Chapter 24 is all about the end. So first he starts like Mo, like Jeremiah warning them. And then he uh, talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of temple, both of which Jeremiah had spoken about. Destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of temple. Now after that, comes, in the case of Jeremiah, comes the invasion of Israel by the Babylonians and uh, the deportations. In this case, in Matthew, after this comes, God will get so many, the arrest of Jesus and his crucifixion, which starts with chapter four, 24, 25, 26, and of course, followed by the resurrection and the ascension. And finally, at the end of chapter 28, Jesus sends the apostles out saying, um, go to all the nations, teach them what I told, taught you, and make them disciples. And lo, I'm with you until the end of times. So this whole book was written not as a story, not as a historical book. It was written to convey the message of the gospel from an eyewitness, in this case, a tax collector, using his literary techniques and the five discourses to the next generation, charging them that they should continue doing the same thing, being apostles, going out, witnessing and teaching and making disciples the rest of the world. Uh, thank you. I am have, I have to stop here. I'm sorry, but I rushed through the session, but it's the final session. I didn't know how I can squeeze all 12, 14 chapters in one hour, but I, I think I tried to it away.